everybody. You're here in the shop of the Kyoto Brothers. I'm Charlie Kyoto. I'm Edward Kyoto. I'm Steven Kyoto. How are you? And you may know us from some of our special effects work from uh, Critters, Elf, Killer Class Matter Space, Dinner for Schmucks, all of that. <laughs> Team America World Police. Oh, yeah, I, we did that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what's cool is after doing stop motion and makeup effects and, and animatronic puppets, now we're doing these live attractions at, at, the, at the zoo. And it's really great to see our creatures come alive and actually interact with an audience. It's really a lot of fun. Yeah, the zoo came to us and they wanted to do something. They asked us if it was possible to make a dinosaur character that can interact with the kids. He said, absolutely. We've, uh, we've always been fascinated with dinosaurs, and we're thrilled to get anything, any project that has dinosaurs involved. We worked with Sid and Marty Croft on the revival of Land of the Lost. We designed all the little dinosaurs. You know, we did stop motion compositing when digital uh, compositing was uh, in its early stages. And it, was a, it was a great show, and working with Sid and Marty was terrific. But um, we had uh, the opportunity now, um, with uh, the ever-growing interest in dinosaurs, when I was a kid, when we were kids, there were nine dinosaurs. You could count them on your, on, your, on your hands. Now, I don't know how many species there are. They got feathers now. Sounds like a Vegas show to me. I like my T-Rex, you know, you know uh, scaly and scary. But, um, but when they came to us as a zoo, they wanted a living dinosaur, but they also wanted a character. So you can go out there and create, let's say, a neutral looking like a thunder lizard, which is kind of like an alligator, not much personality. But we bring character to it. So they wanted a female uh, herbivore, and Charlie came up with the, this, this one. This is our little Parasaurolophus. Um, and again, the colors were chosen uh, by the, uh, the sponsors of the zoo. And uh, they, they wanted a green. And I, I tried different color bellies, and they kind of liked the pinkish belly. And she's, uh, again, Bambi's mother type, uh, 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 a mother, um, whether she'll trot out a little baby you know, sometime in the, in the near future. It yeah, remains even, to be seen. Even scale-wise, though, she's an adolescent. She's nowhere near what a, a full-size one would be. Yeah. Uh, we work with uh, our project supervisor, DBH, and we've designed this uh, perfectly balanced dinosaur. The performer sits inside, although you see his visible legs, the creature is balanced right on the guy's between the tail and the head, and uh, actually it weighs about 75 pounds, and it's really a, a, a walk in the park. 75 pounds is a good weight. You know, we're trying to improve that. You know, if we can get down to 50, that's great. A 50-pound backpack is a, a basic backpack if you're going hiking or something like that. 75 is a little sturdy, but uh, it seems Stephen's able to, uh, to manipulate it very well. Yeah, the thing is that the zoo wanted something that could definitely interact with the kids on a one-to-one -one basis. Because uh, they bring out live animals all the time, but they don't do what you want to do when you want them to do it. So what can we do? So basically create a character, a puppet, a large puppet. So the idea is we, we designed this character. It's all built around a, a lightweight harness, aluminum understructure, foam construction, uh, muscle structure with a pretty sophisticated skin put over it. What's interesting, it's, uh, it's actually uh, a giant puppet. Um, you know, a, a guy in a suit, you would have a six foot, seven foot tall creature. We've seen all that. This is a 10 foot tall creature. She's almost 20 feet long. Duncan is, uh, what is he, 16 feet or 20 feet long? He's Duncan is 15 feet long, 15 seven feet, feet tall. Yeah, and uh, you know, they're giant puppets, and uh, they come to life with uh, a mechanical articulation and eye blinks and stuff. They even have a voice box that actually you know, simulates uh, a human voice and makes it sound like a dinosaur. Growl. We could make them talk like Scooby-Doo, but we said we don't want to do that. You know, he was like, things like, oh, hi, kids. Actually, they, they do, do it that. anyway. They do that. <laughs> it's funny, actually. They use it. They come out in kind of full full dinosaur mode with the roaring, but then if they sense the kids are a little scared or taken back, they kind of go into Scooby-Doo mode to, to kind of take the edge off of it. Well, it's real interesting, too. The first time we saw the performance, there was a, maybe a three or four-year-old in a stroller. When Duncan came out, the little kid was strapped in, and he was going, <laughs> trying to get out, and no one was paying attention to him. It was horrifying. But, you know, then, you know, we, we said, no, he's friendly, he's friendly. And I think seeing the human legs there, sort of gives the kids some comfort because it's just all of a sudden yeah. what looks like frighteningly real. Imagine when you're you know, three feet tall seeing a 15-foot dinosaur coming at you. They say, oh, it's fake. It's, it's not. It's just a, it's, it's make-believe. And, and that's the beauty of having a live performer in there. He can really gauge his performance. It's, it's truly interactive. He, he can get down onto the kid's level. Yeah, and I think he's turned into a big dog. So it kind of walks around like this big, friendly, golden retriever, <laughs> like this. And, and I think the kids really get a kick out of it. Yeah, so now we've got Lily that's going to be joining, uh, joining Duncan up at the zoo. You know what? Uh, we've been working in films going on 30 years now, uh, primarily movie and television. 
uh, props and creatures were made from cut to cut. You know, if you needed an arm, uh, we make an arm for the shot. We make a face, make a head explode. Well, like that's the kind of stuff. Puppets for specific, yeah, you know, that, specific that, gags. That's the big difference in a feature film. Everything is really kind of shot specific and what the director's vision is. So you build something for a specific angle, a spe specific usage. The live uh, thing, it's it's 360 degree prop that lives and breathes in that in that world. So there's a lot of considerations that you have to give. That uh, you know you, you're performing in front of an audience. It's uh, up close stuff. It's like up close magic. You can't get away with that stuff. You know, uh, we're not 30 feet away on a stage, and we're not, you know, the, the camera, you can cheat a bunch of stuff. Yeah, there's no cheating with this. And But back to, with all those challenges, though, the best part is that you're working with a live audience there. You're not just doing a two second cut or a three second cut or just rolling a series of just reactions, reactions, reactions. You're doing a performance. So you have an opportunity to get a rapport with the audience and actually get some kind of re feedback from them. So as a performer and also the creators, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a blast. Yeah, and it's funny actually, the difference between the two, in a, in a movie you're expecting it to be absolutely real, so that's something to strive for in terms of the detail, the paint job, everything, all the materials that go into it, the, the finishing techniques. In a live venue, especially in a theme park or a, a zoo that's, uh, you know, for younger kids, there's a, that, that suspension of disbelief, they, they want to believe, so like the legs of our characters totally disappear. Nobody ever mentions, as I can see, the legs. All they talk about is they see the dinosaur. Well, one little kid did, though, and it kind of ticked me off. He kept on pointing at the legs. I was, if, I, if I had the T-Rex, I was going to bite his head off. He's like one of those little know-it-all kids. But, you know, it's the thing is, one. the consideration yeah. that you have, uh, that you don't have in, in doing stuff for motion pictures is durability. We build a prop that lasts through the duration of a shoot, you know, five weeks, six weeks, sometimes just one day for a commercial, two days for a commercial. In terms of this, this is a long range thing. We have to uh, make sure that it's not gonna break down, that it's gonna be good for possibly years of performance. Yeah, these, these characters on average perform four times a day, seven days a week, um, 365 days a year. Well, it's interesting, in the 90s, a lot of the work we did as special effects artists and stop motion and some practical animatronics was kind of going to the wayside because of the new shiny toy, CG. But now, it's kind of, I think it's running in cycles. I think people are kind of tired of the consistency of the imagery delivered by CG. So I think there's a new generation of kids who just love the old 80s movies and well, the rubber. It's funny, the, the, the kids are coming up to the business today and growing up their introduction is to CG imagery, so that's what they're doing. So now when they see a stop motion movie like Paranorman or Coraline or Nightmare Before Christmas, they, what is that? It, you know, they, they don't, without articulating, they sense something is unusual about it, that it's real. And now, again, the stop motion, the practical stuff, the things that we do, the puppetry, that's the new thing to these kids. Yeah, yeah it's the new th they've discovered it. It's like their discovery now. Uh, we're old school, we were raised on that. There's something about the hand crafting that we like. There's something about being on set, operating critters and having rattlesnakes crawling around underneath you. But there's something neat about being on set and watching the T-Rex come down live yeah, and, uh, and the kids I, I are reacting the audiences, to that. Yeah. The audiences see it, again, without being able to articulate it. They know when something's real. And, I mean, a, a exactly. puppet there like that T-Rex coming down through the top of that car, those kids are screaming because they could have been killed. <laughs> Really? No, that's <laughs> interesting. Yes, and for us, it's a natural transition. Now, how do you preserve that, that real-time, real-life experience? And that it's theme parks, it's, uh, it's the amusement parks, it's zoos, museums, We're offering this sort of live experience to them where the kids could actually interact face-to-face. -face. And uh, part of the, what we've done uh, out of the USJ experience was that they wanted something tactile that guests could actually go up and touch and sense that they were touching a living, breathing creature. This has been around since the dawn of man. These kind of theatrical experiences will be here forever. I think the film techniques, it's just a way for some people to make money. I don't think it really delivers the kind of experience that's gonna be uh, uh, withstanding, long-standing. Well, they're trying to get the audience to immerse themselves in a motion picture by bringing the images off the screen. Well, in a live performance, the people are immersed in the experience. And you can't even, deny it. It's even gone one step further than that. Typically, we've all seen the walk arounds at Disneyland, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, Goofy, Pluto, all those guys, and you, it's a photo op. You go there and take a picture. But now, we're starting to tell stories with these characters. So they're, we're, we're upping the entertainment value of that live experience. It's just not going to see a cool character running around and have your picture taken with it now. Now they're telling stories, interactive things. Well, yeah, like at Universal City Japan, the, 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 the story of those dinosaurs being in the park was that they escaped from the park, from the ride. Yeah. The so they had to get them back in the pen. So there was this kind of funny little storyline of the baby running around and the mom kind of going after it, trying to corral the baby back into the barn. And the audience, I mean the, the crowd, had to help the park get the dinosaurs back in their pen. Yeah, so, so in addition to the, uh, the full-size uh, dinosaurs, 
Santa Barbara wanted a, uh, you know, Dean Noble wanted something that they could actually take out to schools and other, some of their other outreach programs. So we uh, designed this baby triceratops. Oh, she's Well, she's just a, uh, she's the simplest kind of puppet, a hand puppet, yeah. like a sock that you put in, yeah, you put your hand simple. in. And she has remote control eyes. So now you'll be able to have the kids walk right up to her and touch her. It's got kind of like a realistic leathery type skin. It's, a, it's a, just a play on the old uh, puppeteering trick. Steven's arm is inside the puppet operating. It's a hand puppet with uh, radio control eyes. Hang on to that. Um, but uh, actually, in play in the zoo, he's actually wear, the performer will wear a costume where it'll have a, uh, a fake arm coming down, holding the triceratops underneath its belly. And then his, while well, the performer's arm goes inside to operate it. The kids love this. So we, on, our, on our first outing, uh, the kids were running over to her saying, Mommy, Mommy, look, a real dinosaur. Look, look. Yeah, this is great. It's, it was, it's a lot of fun making these kind of guys. Okay. So Stephen actually is supporting it. There's a, a backpack assembly that he wears over his shoulders and on his hips that supports the entire structure. And then there's a, uh, a mechanism inside the, the cockpits right here that allows him to do all the head movement, uh, crane the neck up and down, move the head left and right. It can, it can rotate. The eyes blink. There's a, uh, a little computer c controller in there that's programmed to have like a random eyes look. Well, one of the challenges with any of these live attractions, and if it was a motion picture effect, we would use foam latex or some other um, short-term material, but this is a, a character that performs four or five times a day, seven days a week um, for years. So we needed to develop something that was, uh, that would last and be lightweight. So we developed a special uh, uh, silicone and spandex solution. It's kind of a proprietary thing we developed here that uh, creates a very flexible, lifelike, not only looking, but uh, tactile. It actually feels uh, like a real skin texture. And it's very durable. I think we have Duncan working for almost three years now. Uh, it hasn't faded. It hasn't uh, ripped or torn. It's uh, a very, very versatile and, and uh, durable fabric. Like Charlie said, it's, it's color fast and UV protected so it doesn't fade. Yeah, Duncan, Duncan's been in playing for two years now, over, just over two years, and he looks like the day he walked out of the shop. Wow. Can I walk a little further forward? You can go forward. You can go yeah. forward. Yeah. Okay. It's pretty light. I mean, it, you know, it's perfectly balanced on my hips, not even my shoulders. And uh, I mean, that's uh, DBH did a great job in designing a really elegant interior. I feel like I'm in a little Piper Cub cockpit. And it's uh, very easy to operate. A lot of college kids, maybe high school seniors will be operating it at the zoo. So it's got to be really easy. Yeah, part of our criteria is we actually talk to firefighters when they carry their packs, we ask them what's the maximum weight that they carry on their packs, and they, they carry 80 pounds. So that was always our upward number, that it can't weigh more than 80 pounds. What we try to do is we try to get an experienced puppeteer or suit performer in the suit, take some video, so we can use that as a training uh, tool for the, uh, for the young people that are you know, working the suit up at the zoo. And, actually, and what you're seeing here is that this is an unpainted dinosaur. Um, the head has just got the, some base colors on it, but that's the next step for it. You've caught us just near the very end of the process here. So the next couple of days, it's just going to be uh, some final seaming, some final stitching, a fair amount of that, and then uh, painted to look like a living dinosaur. Magic has always been in the movies. Now we're bringing the magic to the live venues. And the magic, I think, is the key word. It's what people yeah. want to and see. For us here at Kyoto Bros, it's always been about the characters anyway. And we bring the characters to life in the best way possible. And in this instance, it's, you know, in this case, it's a hand puppet. And in that case, it's a giant walk around puppet. Yeah, and I think the audience might perceive that it's not absolutely real. But the fact that it's emoting and getting a reaction, that's magic. That there's this, this uh, uh, believability in it that makes them kind of just kind of go with it. So. We've done it in motion pictures, and now we think it's a great opportunity to work with Santa Barbara Zoo because now 
we're bringing these live fantasy characters to these kids and it's it's real it's just it's uh it's, it must be a wonderful moment to see like you were saying a a 15 foot tall creature standing there in front of you it must be fantastic yeah for the Magic. zoo it's it's able to bring people in to get that one-on-one -on -one experience that they just don't they're not getting other places you know the zoos again it's a little safe haven for this interactive experience yeah and the magic comes from you've got a real elephant you've got a real lion a real alligator now you got a dinosaur well it's because of its association with the rest of the zoo it's just as real so that's magic oh it was great about the santa barbara zoo and, and dean noble they get it they came to us with, a, with an idea that was exactly in line with what we should be doing, bringing it to live audiences. And we were pleased and thankful to the Santa Barbara Zoo and Dean and all his supervisors and, uh, and the people involved with the zoo for, for giving us this opportunity to do this. Well, if any of you guys out there have any kind of creative force, have a, a vision of something you want to create, I say just go do it. There'll be a lot of people telling you not to, a lot of reasons why you shouldn't, but if you believe in something, if you believe in a vision or have a passion, I say just do it and you'll be having a lot of fun in the future. Yeah, we have a lot of young people come to us. They show us their portfolios, their sculptures, their artwork, their paintings and stuff. And we tell them if this is your passion, just do it. If you want to paint, paint every day. If you want to sculpt, sculpt every day. If you want to draw, draw every day. Charlie sketches, there's not a piece of paper that is safe around him. His hands are always moving. He does it all the time. I don't have a pencil. You know what I'd say? You know, do what you love. And what you want to do is share that love with as many people. And what you'll find is a lot of people love the same thing that you do. So create your love and show it to us. I want to see it. Give us some love. <laughs> Hey, we're the Kyoto Brothers, and I'm glad you guys had a chance to take a sneak peek at our lily for the Santa Barbara Zoo. I'm Stephen Kyoto with the Kyoto Brothers saying bye. Ed Kyoto. I'm Charlie Kyoto, and thanks for joining us. Hey, and make sure you get out to the Santa Barbara Zoo to see our dinosaurs. With the whole family. Yeah, there's always something cooking at the Santa Barbara Zoo. Don't miss it.